Welcome back to our video module on mechanics and materials. We spent the last couple sessions looking at the stress strain diagram to get an understanding of how materials, mainly metals, work when some sort of stress is applied to, you know, a bar or something like that. However, I haven't been entirely forthcoming. I've actually made a number of assumptions, and before we go any further, we're going to have to briefly mention what those assumptions are and I'll leave exploration of these topics to a later time. First, I'm talking about stress, but what I really mean here is true stress and true strain. That means what's really happening. Secondly, I've talked about the elastic limit as something is stretched and released and stretched and released, and we're going to say this is for low number of cycles, and that may be like five, six, maybe a couple hundred but we're not talking millions. Third, when I talked about the elastic session, I didn't include any situation where we applied some sort of stress, the material stretching, we have some sort of strain, and then you hold it there for a long time. So no long-term stress. Finally, I've been looking at normal materials. So not all materials act in this way, Normal materials, these are most steels, well, all steels, and lots of aluminums, coppers, brasses, that type of thing. In addition, this means the material is in good shape. So there's not any major cracks, the, you know, the surface isn't really rough or, I don't know, dipped in an acid solution. Today, we'd like to take a look at one of these assumptions and say what happens if we ignore it. And that's going to be the low number of cycles. In other words, what happens if we take some sort of sample, we'll say some steel, and we stretch it and release it, stretch it and release it, we stretch and release it millions of times. You can imagine an automobile engine. Is it still going to act just like we thought it would? This is the concept known as fatigue. And it can be understood by thinking of it in the following way. What we're going to do is we're going to stretch a sample, relax it, stretch a sample, relax it, stretch a sample, relax it. In other words, we're going to go on this curve right here tons of times up and down. And we see something really interesting happen. We find that, uh, well, let's, let's take a look at what we find. On the vertical part, we're going to put the uh, stress. And on the horizontal, we're going to put the number of cycles that a sample can endure before it fails. We're going to put this in on a um, logarithmic scale. We find that when we record the breaking stress, in other words, the stress that happens at failure, and compare it with the number of cycles, we see something that looks basically like this. This is, say, for some carbon steel. And each material has something different. To create this diagram, scientists take samples of various metals, apply some sort of stress to it, say 75% of, of their yield stress, and they measure how many cycles it takes in or before the material ruptures. What we see is that as we increase the number of cycles on our sample, the amount of stress that it can endure before rupturing, it decreases and decreases and decreases until it hits some sort of point. And this point is called the fatigue limit. This is the point that as long as we keep the stresses below this limit, the fatigue limit, we can cycle the sample as many times as we want, basically. We define this number as however much stress a sample can endure after five times 10 to the ninth cycles. This type of shape pretty much exists for all types of ferrous materials. It'll look different depending on the carbon content, depending on anything else in there. However, for other materials, it doesn't look like this in many cases at all. For instance, aluminum may start here, and as the cycles increase, it just keeps going down and down and down. 
when we look at our fatigue limit, aluminum is going to be really low. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why aluminum and other materials like it are really bad choices for applications where there's a whole lot of expansion and contraction or a whole lot of stress release, stress release, stress release. This diagram helps us understand the concept of fatigue and we call it an SN diagram. Now out of curiosity, what's really happening? Well, you can imagine some sort of sample here, right? This is some sort of sample of steel. We're going to apply some force, you know, I don't know, force applied and then some sort of force reaction. And in this steel, there's this itty bitty crack. And of course, I'm exaggerating it here enormously. It stretches a little bit and that results in a stress concentration while you're sampling it right here. Well, that stress concentration is too much. So what ends up happening is this material, it, stre it cracks just a little bit more. And then the next time you pull, it cracks a little bit more. And eventually you have enough cracking that the whole thing gives way. One can also imagine that you're applying the force and you end up with a stress concentration here. But because of something going on in the material, that stress concentration isn't quite big enough for these small imperfections to propagate through the material. In summary, when a material is subject to a large number of tension compression cycles, a phenomenon known as fatigue can be observed. And we see that for most ferrous materials, there's a fatigue limit. This is the maximum amount of stress you can apply to a material for it to not fail no matter how many cycles you apply.